Let's talk about a little bit the uh, gestation of this film. When I first heard about it, you said you were going to do it as a western, and uh, and I think the two, I think the thing that really struck me the most about it, I mean, the big difference between Irina and this film, obviously, is you brought it into the daylight, and it's interesting you brought and and, and uh, what, what I was was struck by was like how beautiful you were, you know, you were, you know, very serene and you know, like that too, and you were obviously going for a very different approach than you did for the first one. Yeah, I mean, they, again, they coexist together, and they're both examining in an abstract way, allegorically or metaphorically, certain aspects of the human condition, I think. But I think this is a Western. I really do. I think it moves. You know, one of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in the West, with its long, slow takes and use of... Uh, sorry, my voice is, as you can see, I went to a skinny puppy concert last night. <laughs> um, uh, long, slow takes and excessive use of overly dramatic Ennio Morricone music. You know, we don't have Ella, uh, Della Dorsa, but we have Cary Gemmell. The beautiful voice uh, that can kind of take us to that netherworld. Uh, so I really do think this is an arid western about lonely people and coexisting on a very uh, savage, beautiful terrain, somehow coming together for whatever purposes. So um, yeah, I mean, it, to me, it is an, uh, you know one of the original endings of the movie. Uh, there's a bunch of different endings. One, uh, she just stops when the car shows up. And then we have Taya Monster from the Toronto Zombie Walk, and this version coming out and taking her right to the unknown, which I think is kind of cool too. Uh, and then we had another version that, if you've seen Blood for Irina, it takes place in this hellhole motel. And we have Shauna suddenly waking up where she's back in the motel and then doing her normal walk through this nightmare street. And I thought that was kind of cool too, because one of the takes I have in these Irina movies is that really all they are is fever dreams of a very mentally ill person that fantasizes that they are in Irina, in Blood for Irina, she's the victim. Uh, she lost her child, the vampire destroyed her, and now she's slave to her addiction, she's dying, she's completely out of control and miserable and uh, unempowered, and she actually, her last act of whatever redemption she has is to empower a prostitute who is also at the end of her rope. Uh, so her curse becomes this prostitute's blessing. So in this one I thought, well, Instead of Irina being the victim, now we have her being this uh, kind of goddess, this queen who just kind of ravages the world, goes on and on through time. I mean, it did start in the unknown Western world, and then it kind of leaks after she gives birth into, uh, I guess, a, a photocopied version of the contemporary world. Um, we do have uh, uh, Sean and Carrie are here, though. Uh, you guys are going to come out? Yeah? No? Okay, you can sit there if you want. <laughs> Uh, Shauna, Irina in both films, in, in, uh, in Queen of Blood, uh, Carrie was the widow, and in Blood for Irina, she was Pink Hooker, this is my wife, so go figure. Uh, she also did the, the music with me as well, and over there, Ali leaning against the pole looking very, very Anton Corbin-like. Uh, that's Ali Jaffrey, uh, who did all those wailing guitar squeals every time Irina dug her fingers into somebody's neck. And uh, all around the peripheral here, who else to uh, stand up if you were in the movie or had something to do with it? I can't see you. Uh, Laura Lee, Caruso, Jim Sinclair, Elder Jim Sinclair, Cheryl Singleton, who co-produced the film with us, and who's also one of Ogre's victims, uh, Catherine Lalonde, who also gets in that one scene where it looks like Ogre's uh, giving it to you, he's actually killing you, uh, in the swamp. Uh, who else is in our little thing? Amy, where's Amy? Ah, Amy, who gets shown his fingers up her, uh, in her neck against the, in one of those little montage scenes. And uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. Oh, if you were in my movie, then great. Uh, cool. <laughs> um, what was, um, one question I asked filmmakers when they, when they made their second film is what did you learn from the first film as a filmmaker that helped you with the process of making this one? And what? And the second part of this is, what are you going to learn from this film that going forward on to the next film that you're starting? Well, I, you know, I deliberately tried with these two movies to create this really slow, hypnotic, environmental film where both of them, where you kind of, uh, you know, I really, and I'm not comparing myself um, to Werner Herzog or any of these guys, but you really, you watch my, one of my favorite movies is a Gary the Wrath of God, and uh, when you watch that movie, it's not plot driven; it's just about a madman going down river, Klaus Kinski. This is our, our Klaus Kinski in many respects, and so is Ogre, he's also our Klaus Kinski. But uh, you get lost in that environment, you know, just listen to the sounds of nature as this guy, it just, it's the natural world with something incredibly unnatural happening within it. And uh, both of the movies, uh, Blood Fragment and Queen of Blood, are really about that. 
um, how beautiful and the world looks while these horrible things are going on. And, but the world doesn't care, you know, the nature does not care, and it's not personal, it's just, you're just n nothing to it. Uh, and so that's kind of the philosophy behind the two of them. So what I learned, uh, you know, their approach radically different. We've had, I'll tell you what I learned, here's what I learned. At Blood for Arena we had uh, literally under $10,000 to make it. And uh, we kept it very intimate, very controlled, uh, a couple people in the cast completely shot it when we could. Uh, and it was, you know, clothing off the rack that Sean and Carrie chose, and uh, really just uh, the three of us kind of just figuring out how to make this little piece of art. And then with Queen of Blood, suddenly I start to think cosmically, my God, I'm going to make this giant epic, and, and then there was supposed to be a little bit of money, and then it <laughs> ended up being the same amount of money as Blood for Arena. Uh, but I still was thinking epic, 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 which was stupid. You know, that was my first rule was like, always, and I always tell my students when I talk film history, it was like, you know, do what you can within your means. So we had to change a lot of the movie as the movie got cheaper. And we did spend money to bring Ogre in. Not a lot, God bless him, why the hell did he, who knows? But he came in and did it, and it was amazing. And then we had Alex Cavanaugh, who did all the costumes for Repo, for the Saw movies, uh, for Ginger Snaps 2 and 3, right? Um, I mean, a rich body of work when it comes to, you know, horror and fantasy in Canada. I mean, she was one splice, and the list goes on who wanted to come on board because she liked Blood for Irina and uh, kind of co-produced this with us and did all these really richly detailed costumes, which, again, I apologize, uh, this is my gaff. I must have given the wrong cut. Uh, but when, again, when you see them in their pristine glory, and they're really nice. And uh, so we had all these amazing people working with us, but we had multiple locations, and we were zipping here and there, and out of that barn, that skeletal barn shack thing. Well, we, we had no permits or anything, so we like, Ogre, Shauna, and I, and Dave Goodfellow, we ended up going to this field with this giant, that should be Irina's castle, that's her Dracula's castle, let's go, let's get in there. And we thought the, uh, the crops were all dead, these dried up crops, so we started walking through these crops, and uh, Ogre, you know, Ogre's dressed in his Robert Mitchum preacher outfit, Shauna is looking like she does, like completely coated in blood and doing her Caligari through the thing. And suddenly out of nowhere, we thought this farm was dead, right? No, we almost got dead. This giant, like it looked like a fucking go-bot, this giant uh, tractor thing took <laughs> right to the field, and Ogre's just standing there, you know, God bless him, badass, looking at this thing. I swear to God, it stopped by his boot. The thing is like, was like 20 feet tall. I'm not exaggerating, this is crazy. Shauna can back me up. Sean and I start walking, okay, bye, let's get it. Ogre just stands there. <laughs> this, this crazy farmer comes out with it. Oh, no, he didn't have a shotgun. In my mind, I'm imagining he did. Uh, and he comes out and he starts screaming at us, he goes, get up. And apparently they were soybean crops. And soybean crops look dead, but they're not. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing on my crops, you motherfuckers? I'll fucking kill you. But I'm like, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, sir. And Ogre is just like, yeah, what's the problem? Well, what's the problem? You know, he's not alarmed at the fact that he's got a preacher and a blood-soaked woman in his field. He's just mad we're stepping on his soybeans. <laughs> And uh, he's like, you come back to my farm, I'll cut your fucking legs off. And Ogre's like, you know, well, if you cut our fucking legs off, how are we going to get out of here? <laughs> no. So it was like, oh, and then we, we had to run and get to the car, then we had to drive to the other barn and shoot there. So we were just like going nuts shooting this thing, multiple locations, and it was really crazy. So I guess, long story short, I apologize for that, uh, is that, you know, I think uh, next time you just, you know, you dream within your means and then uh, work with your strengths. Uh, so I think we did the best what, what we did. I think it was a very ambitious movie, and maybe one day when uh, somebody backs up the money truck, which is, there is potential for that uh, on the horizon, I will be able to fully, absolutely realize my dream fantasy vampire horror western. Well, I think you really pulled it off, so congratulations. <laughs> All right, questions from the audience. Why Aiden, this film was filmed in scenic Burlington, Ontario. And Oakville, Ontario. And lovely Milton, Ontario. And anywhere else in Ontario? Where? Willow Beach, Ontario. So this is really is an Ontario Gothic. And uh, no, we just, it was, you know, I, I, I did this with Irina too. I built the movie uh, based around the, this motel I found that they were about to wreck. And I, I, the moods I felt around those locations, and we did the same thing with Queen of Blood. Um, you know, we found places. 
We said, my God, you can feel this place. You, know, you can feel the desolation, the decay, the ruin, the grandeur of it. And we, we literally built the movie. You know, I, I'm not a script guy. I'm kind of a guitar guy where fuck the script. You just have the, the ideas and the scenes and the moods and the tones. And we also, we did a lot of the music uh, first too, just so we could feel it. And then you just kind of build the, uh, the movement around the, the scenes. And it really, Ontario is, is any filmmaker who lives in Ontario knows if you're looking for uh, you know, haunted places, uh, it's, or it's a trove, and it's unmined. I mean, a lot of people haven't shot uh, at these, these amazing places, and uh, thank God for that, because I think there's a nice alien feeling to a lot of our movies in that sense. You don't know where the hell you are. You avoid, we avoid license plates, we avoid time, space, we don't know where we are or what planet we're on. And I think that will give the movie, if anyone gravitates towards them in the long term, as a package deal, because I think that's the value of these movies, is that uh, they'll be taken as a whole, as a body of work, as different movements in a larger symphony. I think that uh, the fact that they are uh, set in unknowable times and places with, with, again, actors and faces that you don't normally see elsewhere, or that are used in different ways, I think maybe they'll have some sort of longevity. Well, Shauna was very oral in the first one. Uh, it's all about her lips and her mouth and how she, uh, you know, would lock and she was vomiting. So if you've seen the first one, she's sick, she's dying. It's like my rip off of Udo Kier in, in Blood for Dracula. She's dying. Uh, so it's on, on. It's a fetish. I'm a fetish filmmaker, right? So it's all the fetishization of the vomits and the splashing the lens. And, uh, but this one, no, she's completely. I loved having the face like carved marble all the time, where she really only once in a while, when it's an important feed, that she get her. Now thirty, but mostly it's channeled through her finger things. And you know, we were thinking about doing the effects, and we we're doing that. Should we show the little suctions and shit? I'm like, no. It just it's the expression, of it, just the act of it. And I stole that. You know, may have called, but I stole that from an episode of Buck Rogers, the Space Vampire episode. If anyone's ever seen that, I was a little boy. I think it was like four or five. And my dad and I watched that, and I was scared to death because this this like Nosferatu guy came in, but he didn't bite. He just which just fingers in your throat, and that was it. It was bloodless, but it was the idea of it. So, and again, I, I'm not a, I, I'm using horror tropes and cliches to do different things, but I don't really uh, have any interest in a particularly straight up uh, a genre movie at all. I was really enjoying kind of like a VHS quality to it. <laughs> I'm glad you were. <laughs> No, well, you know, listen, the movie was shot with the multiple cameras, and Kelly, this, this is my fault, okay? Not, not blood in the snow, this is my fucking fault, because I'm like a juggernaut, jugging from one thing to another. And we had a couple cuts of this, and this was a, a kind of a last minute cut I did. I think I gave the wrong one, I think. But it does have the, yeah, but there is some moment, I'm, certainly the movie does not look like a, a million dollar movie. It has a certain kind of organic, weird, textual quality. We did use, you know, uh, you know, we used the Canon, oh, we used good cameras, but then we also used iPhones, and we used different things, so... And also the important thing too I should mention is that both in this movie and the uh, Queen of Blood, and you know, again, loving Herzog, loving Terrence Malick, guys like that, is that I, I don't believe in going in afterwards and changing what I've seen to make it look like it's coming out of a piece of software. I don't think that betrays what you, your eyes have seen. So everything that we saw, we kept. Uh, you know, obviously the sound design is completely fabricated, but the um, as every great Euro trash movie is. But uh, the, the visuals were everything we caught on camera was not the doctor at all. Because the answer you always say is, yes, I intended that completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the back? Uh, what much uh, laughing was going on during Ogre's death scene? <laughs> not much because it was the end of the day and we were just like knackered and it was just like, you know, we just had to we'd do it. and. Uh, yeah, no, I'll tell you, you know, no, no, because Ogre, by that time, we put it through the freaking ringer. Like, you know, that, that, everything was once, that shot we did was just like two takes, you're running through this forest, like, you know, he flipped over that tree for real, and you don't hear the thud, and boom. And, and you know, he got it, it was like, fuck, I'm 52, and I still got it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, most of it, it was, what I'll tell you, what was really funny with the Ogre stuff, it was probably me more laughing than him and all of us, because, you know, Carrie and I are skinny puppy fans since we were, you know, in high school. And uh, the fact that the pinch me stuff that Ogre not only has got on a plane and come to sunny Oakville to shoot Queen of Blood for lunch money, but the fact that I'm directing Ogre 
And I'm yelling at Ogre because that guy talks a lot. And he's a very disruptive guy on set because he's always talking and people want to listen to him and he doesn't listen to you and he doesn't move when you tell him. And, and uh, so it was constantly, Ogre, you son of a, you know, get over there, get over there, we gotta go, 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 go. He has no sense of time. So it was a really, you know, we were laughing at the absurdity of, of, of our little fun little lot in life. Uh, but I'll tell you what's kind of cool too is that, um, again, we're inventing it as we, we went along to some degree. Ogre mentioned as he was getting on the plane, he said, and I got this idea about the preacher, you know, of, because um, originally the preacher was just supposed to come and offer himself. But he's like, I got this idea of a talisman, which kind of in a way looks like he's a threat to her, you know, like a stake. Uh, but it's also, a, a, you know, a version of a cross. And I was kind of like, I could kind of see it. I said, well, can you make it work? He says, yeah, I can make it work. But he comes off the plane, he didn't have that thing at all. He had a piece of leather. And I said, well, what are we going to do? He's like, oh, just, we'll just figure it out. And so we went to the forest and literally, he's like, okay, let's do this. Who's got a knife? Someone had a knife and that whittling and everything, he invented that on the spot. And so the two of us kind of said, all right, now he's going to do this. And now here's the meaning behind this. And, and then uh, we shot all that. that. He invented this mythology. And so when it came time to shoot Jim stuff, uh, at the end of the movie where it ties into this, this weird connection that mankind has to this queen of nature, uh, it was just, you know, we were saying whittling a stick and then Dave Goodfellow our co-DP, co-producer, said, you know, well, why don't we tie that into Hoger's idea? So it was just really cool that he had that input, and that really, to me, gave the movie this kind of alien coolness, you know. I think that comes naturally. <laughs> <laughs> actually didn't want me to have any emotion, but I think I actually ended up with a little bit more than he initially wanted, <coughs> but it, I think it still worked. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, just have to sort of go in that dark place, obviously not think of anything happy, and you just got to do it, and Chris's style is always very quick, so it's actually not a lot of thinking. You just, you just kind of do it, and I don't know. It's just, <laughs> Well, that's true. I don't I think you should overthink things. I, I wanted that natural kind of vibe to it, right? But I mean, the first one we did, there was a lot of preparation with emotion and because that was a real human being uh, where that had remorse and was in hell. Uh, with this, she's not. She's the Terminator. It's a body count movie. She's, the, she's, she's an automaton. Uh, and so I wanted her to be blank and unfeeling. The only time she, she exhibits emotion, and that's another cut of the movie where it just ends like that, where, where she first feeds her baby. Because that's the whole point of nature, is to, the only time it finds any, if you can think nature has any pleasure, or takes any kind of sensory, you know, is even cognizant of anything going on, it's when it makes more of itself. Because it's all it's supposed to do, whether she's a virus or she's some kind of element that's natural, and it just wants to continue. So the only time she finds any kind of joy, really, is when she's um, yeah, feeding her infant, her stolen infant. Uh, I got room, time for one more. It was, you know, it was it was crazy because we we did um, we did blood for Irina for a, a TLA, uh, an imprint called Autonomy Pictures, which is now defunct. Uh, the Buddy Game was invented to release a movie called The Buddy Game, which is the antithesis of these movies. Very very rough. Uh, it's closer in spirit, in fact, to the film that opened the, the movie. We got Blood for Irina done, and it was kind of like our, their first movie they financed and got out there, and it actually did really well. Uh, I haven't seen the goddamn penny. But, that's standard, I anticipated, right, this would be the one that got away. Uh, but uh, it did, it was like number three top selling Blu-ray in Toronto at some point, uh, was it, or Canada or something. Anyways, it was, did really well. And so they said, well, you know, let's, let's do another one. And originally I was going to go with another company, but I went with uh, them because they would let me do whatever I want. But they wanted it fairly quickly, so they could turn it around to festivals and move it and move it and move it. And so we did, uh, we rushed this thing very, very quickly, you know, poor Shauna was like, come on, move, go, go, you gotta do this, 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 whoa, I'm not ready, you gotta come out of this swamp at the beginning, nude, and you gotta do this, you gotta do this, whoa, what, who, where? Uh, but she played ball, and she went in there, and she got, yeah, there was a lot of makeup in this, and it was freezing cold, and, and uh, you know, with one thing about, uh, you know, Shauna and Carrie is that it's like, here's what we're gonna do, and it's gonna get ugly and messy, and you're gonna go outside your comfort zones, and they dedicate themselves to it, which is really cool. Uh, so we did that and it was very, I get very, very, I say very quick in the sense that we had it all laid out, I think within the span of what, three or four weeks, principal. Yeah. 
And then, oh yeah, we had a lot of, that's right, Carrie, I mean, geez, we had the, the odds against this. It was very troubled. This is the one, this is like the, if someone documented it, it would be Hearts of Darkness Jr. Because our little boy, Ben, our youngest child, uh, you know, who had a heart attack uh, when he was a year, I guess, heart failure, and he dilated uh, cardiomyopathy, and he wasn't actually expected to live. And, uh, you know, through miracles of uh, many doctors and uh, a loving mom and, and, and me and his brothers, uh, he not only lived, but he, he's, he's thrived. And he has actually, he was on steroids to be the dream of steroids, not on him anymore. So he came out of that and just when we're ready to shoot Queen of Blood, the fucking dog knocks him over and he snaps his femur in half. Literally a couple days before we were about to go to camera. So the poor little guy was at full body cast. Uh, but we just, we went through it anyways with the help of family and, and, and sitters. <laughs> it's like a real mom and pop operation. And we made this epic and uh, you know, God bless Ogre, he was there and, and he still talks about Ben endlessly. Ben, he was there out playing with Ben, doing puzzles with Ben in between takes. And, uh, so yeah, all that shit was going on and then we get the movie done, you know, here I am running all these magazines, doing all this stuff, we got kids, we got all kinds, of, life is insane. And editing this movie at night and, and, and getting it all together in anticipation of the festivals. And, and then uh, our producer, who was instrumental in getting both movies made, who was the you know, guiding force between, behind autonomy, Louis Tice, who's only 43, right? Drops dead of a heart attack in New York. Just they find him dead in the office in the morning. Uh, so that was the beginning of the end of Autonomy Pictures. There's no one really left to steer the ship. And so we rushed into production to get it out there very quickly, which was pointless because it's been sitting, I mean, not sitting, we finished it in uh, Mar uh, March, I guess. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's going to come out in March 2015 through Severn and Severn uh, Films and bought the rights to it, so they'll put it out. So, yeah, crazy little movie. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, if you have any more questions, actually, you can go uh, into the vendor area because you've got some special posters. Um, we're going to have a little autograph session uh, with our leads here and Chris um, in the vendor area. There's like a red table there, and we've got uh, Queen of Blood posters, and they've already been signed by Ogre. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether you liked the movie or didn't, it's, um, you know, it's fine. But uh, the poster, you cannot deny Nick Percival's poster of... Uh, the impression it's supposed to be an amalgam of Shauna and Carrie together. And I was sitting there's the same person in that and with Ogre's eyes behind I mean it's a beautiful piece of art. So we have many posters that Ogre pre-signed for us a couple nights ago. And the rest of us will all put our stamps on and then, you know, we're just giving them away. So we got about thirty of those, I guess, or something like that. So yeah, come get them. And also if you're so inclined, I do have a lift for every night here on Blue Ray. Uh, it's twenty bucks and uh, we are here, we can sign for you. So anyways, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much, Kelly, and Blood to Snow. I'm just really, really proud of this guy. Can we give it up to Kelly? I've known Kelly for years, and he had this little idea to make this little festival, and it's just like every year it's swelling, and, and it's, I'm really proud of you, boy. So, thank you. Okay, thanks.